So now we'll talk about the synthesis of epoxides, uh, and we'll have a little bit of review in this. Uh, it turns out we can do it by SN2. So, and the only way we can do this by SN2, if it's on a ring anyways, is if we have uh, the hydroxyl group here and the bromine in the trans configuration. So one's gotta be a wedge, one's gotta be a dash. Obviously if this weren't on a ring, we'd have free rotation. Uh, and the, the idea is that this oxygen's gonna need to get in position to do backside attack on this carbon with the leaving group right there. Uh, so first thing we're gonna do is we're simply going to deprotonate this hydrogen. That's why we need a strong base. Either sodium hydroxide or potassium t-butoxide are pretty common. Technically we get away with sodium hydride or sodium or lithium or potassium uh, as well. Uh, and in this case, then, once we've deprotonated that hydroxyl group, we'll have a nice strong nucleophile, which is what we need to do SN2. So in this case, he's just going to come in here and do backside attack, kick off the leaving group, and that gets us our epoxide here. Uh, one thing to note about this reaction is we could take this a step further back in time in synthesis and note that we could construct that lovely species from an alkene. And you guys learned how to do this with Br2 and water. Uh, and in this case, it's an anti-addition, and that's why you get the OH and the bromine trans to each other and stuff like that. So from a synthesis purpose, uh, you might be starting with an alkene rather than actually starting with the species I gave you here. Uh, so just wanted to point that out uh, as we'll end this chapter with a little bit of synthesis. Now the second way of making an epoxide here is one you've already learned and starting with an alkene you want to add a per acid or sometimes a peroxy acid is what we call them so and that'll form the alkoxide it's totally review it's reaction you've already seen and I do want to remind you that the most famous peroxy acid is MCPBA and if you look off to the right here that is metachloroproxybenzoic acid so here I've kind of shown it but the key here is you've got the carbon and one two, three oxygens. That's where the CO3 part comes. Uh, in this case, so it looks like a carboxylic acid with one too many oxygens. So I could generically just write RCO3H like we did here. I could write MCPBA as an acronym, which is really common, probably the most common. I could even show the structure of either MCPBA or any peroxy acid, and you're supposed to realize, oh, that's a peroxy acid. That'll turn the alkene into an epoxide. Now the last way we're going to learn to make an epoxide here is what's called the Sharpless Epoxidation. And this is kind of an important one as well as a rather unique one. Uh, most of the time if you form an epoxide that is chiral, you're going to form both versions of it. Uh, the last two reactions we look at, that's exactly what they do. But with the Sharpless Epoxidation, you can form uh, and antimerically pure versions of chiral epoxides. Uh, now it doesn't work for all epoxides. It turns out you need to have an allylic alcohol for this to even be possible. So, and it turns out that if you draw your allylic alcohol here with the allylic alcohol on the upper right, just as I've done in each of these examples as well, then if you use plus diethyl tartrate, so then your oxygen is gonna end up on top for your epoxide. If you use minus diethyl tartrate, then your oxygen is gonna end up on bottom. So, and it turns out your plus uh, enantiomer of diethyl tartrate and your minus enantiomer of diethyl tartrate being chiral themselves, they can uh, provide a chiral environment where only one version of the epoxide is possible to form. So that's kind of the deal here. I'm not gonna go through the mechanism or anything, uh, but you could have a simple predict the products kind of question here. Uh, so, and notice, I don't even have to draw these correctly. So you don't have to draw these on an exam with the allylic alcohol in the upper right. What I usually do if I'm given a question like this is I rotate my molecule around until it is in the upper right, and then I know that the positive DET oxygen is going to be on the wedge bonds. So negative DET, the oxygen of the epoxide would be on the dashed bonds. That's kind of how it works.